Hello and welcome to a very special edition of The Roundhouse. Why is it special? Because we have former U.S. Men's National Team great, former Fox Sports and Fox Soccer pundit, current head coach of Las Vegas Lights FC, Eric Winalda, on with us. We recorded an interview with him a couple of days ago, and you're going to get to hear it right here on The Roundhouse in its entirety. We played a little bit for you on Sports Talk on 600 ESPN El Paso, you're going to hear the you're going to hear the full Monty. Can you hear the full Monty or do you see Anyway, let's just not get into that. Let's get into Locomotive FC as they get ready to face Lights FC this Saturday. Don't forget fireworks after the game 7:30 p.m. start. So get your tickets now if you want in on the action. Michael Balligan and I will have the call for you on your local El Paso Las Cruces CW and via ESPN+. That said, what happened last week was outstanding for Locomotive FC, extending the unbeaten streak to nine games, in part because Omar Salgado did things like this. As I said in my story on 600 ESP and ElPaso.com, Omar Salgado did things to Tulsa left back Anthony Legendre. Bad things. Seba Contreras tap in for his second goal, and it was moves like that that got Omar Salgado named to the USL Team of the Week at forward. Four of four on dribbles. <laughs> Yeah. Recording the assist, 9 of 13 duels, making four recoveries. Salgado had a complete game. Seba Contreras nets his second of the season, but there was another guy who scored. Wonder if we can guess who that might be. Oh yeah, this dude. Jerome Kiesewetter, DDS. Kiesewetter. His 10th goal in 10 games, that ties him atop the USL Championship along with Kevon Freider in what is officially now the race for the golden boot. I don't know about you, but averaging a goal a game, that yeah, looks pretty good. And Jerome Kiesewetter embracing his new nickname. Sends it last minute. Kiffy nods the cross. Kiesewetter, another brace. They call him the orthodontist. Any comment on your nickname, you know, the orthodontist? Have you embraced it at all? <laughs> no, I haven't. I haven't. Um, we were laughing about it, but um, it's a pretty, pretty un uncommon um, nickname, but I'll take it as it is. <laughs> Kiesewetter's efforts also getting continuing mention from USLChampionship.com writer John Arlia, who picks him to get back to his orthodontist ways with two this weekend versus Lights FC, predicting not one but two goals. Oof. Okay. Way to have an opinion, John. First of all, a shout out to my buds over at Seriously Local Podcast, Phil and, and Mika, and the Mika Militia. <laughs> Apparently Mika was the first to come up with the orthodontist. I'd heard that in discussion on their show, and uh, she was the one who coined the phrase. Uh, my mind was kind of going there, but I kept thinking like dentist, and all I could think of was like Hermit the Elf from Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer. Now, Mika's the one who coined the phrase orthodontist. Mad props. And as for... Locomotive FC. As for the individual efforts, let's not forget Logan Ketterer. Seventh shutout of the season, even though he only faced one shot. But it was a heck of a shot. Janu Silva, backward glancing header in the 77th, deflected apparently off Drew Becky. That's what it looks like to me. And Ketterer, pure reaction. Logan Ketterer, seventh shutout of the season, that is third in the USL Championship behind Tampa Bay's outstanding John McCarthy, who has nine, and Zach Lubin, who just earned his eighth shutout of the season for Rising FC with a big win Tuesday night. But here's something else interesting about Ketterer. The shot you saw was the only shot on goal Tulsa Roughnecks FC had all night long. And that means when you go looking for saves made by keepers, you won't find Logan Ketterer anywhere on this list. It takes 22 to make the list, with that one save against Roughnecks FC, Ketterer has 20 on the season, and I'm sure that he and his teammates are fine with not seeing his name anywhere on that list. His coaching staff, too. 
To that end, Locomotive FC, second in the Western Conference, with Phoenix's win on Tuesday, it puts them firmly in possession of first place, with a game in hand, though, El Paso looking to equalize, at least in terms of points, if they can beat Lights FC this Saturday. And by all means, let's not forget the distribution. That's maybe the most important part team-wise for Locomotive FC. Now working their way up to second in the league in terms of number of passes, but as usual, it's not the passes so much as the passing accuracy, and Locomotive FC continues to be four points better than the next closest team as they have throughout much of the season. Atlanta United 2's been up there, Rising FC's been rising, and Swill Park Rangers making an appearance tied for second place. Las Vegas Lights, not bad, 80% passing accuracy on the season. That'll make the subject of our special interview a happy camper. But all the way down the rest of the list, all 36 teams in the USL Championship separated by no more than a percentage point, if not tenths of a percent. Locomotive FC a full 4% better than the next closest team. Hashtag Lowry Ball, hashtag Crazy Train. Couple of important notes. Mark Lowry during his coach's show talked about Meshach Jerome's injury suffered playing for Haiti during Gold Cup action. He says Meshach Jerome is back in El Paso and will recuperate in the Sun City. I'm not sure how long, but it, it will be a considerable amount of time. Um, I, I, I hope we have him back before the end of the season. I'm positive for that, and so is he. Um, you know, our doctors, he actually arrives back in El Paso tonight, so our doctors will take another look at him tomorrow to get a second opinion, and we'll go forward from there. But frankly, it's, it's, it's a big loss. You know, I'm not going to deny it. Um, it'd, be, it'd be silly of me to, to, to say anything else because Mishak is a top, top centre-back. I've said along for me. We have the best centre-backs in the league with him, Chiro, um, and Drew now. Um, so to lose one of them is, is, is a massive loss to him. What he can do with the ball, you can't replace that. And we haven't been able to replace it. Drew can do so much. But what me, and, and Drew will be the first to admit, Meshach's passing ability, and, and Jerome will testify that he plays, you know, he's, 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 he's benefited from it. Um, Jerome's passing ability, Meshach Jerome's passing ability is on a whole other level. So to lose that, does mean there'll be a little bit of adjustment in how we play. We'll have to figure out other ways to play out from the back, other ways to switch the play, um, which we speak about in training a lot. Um, so there'll be some adjustments, not in terms of the style, but in, in how we build out because we've obviously lost that, 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 ex that extra bit of quality in terms of building out under pressure. Locomotive FC certainly getting attention from around the country for its style of play, that possession-based game that, frankly, not everybody can pull off at any level of soccer, much less second division in the United States. Mark Lowry talked about that during his coach's show as well. Because it takes time, it takes work. You know, this it doesn't happen overnight. Um, people want instant success, and I get that. You know, and, and this takes work on the training field, which not everyone wants to do. This takes hours and hours of the players' work, the players listening, the players buying into it, and, and there's some bumps in the road. And, and that's not for everybody, but for me, I think it's the only way. It's the only way I want to coach every day. When I, when I step on the field with these guys, I want to coach, I want to teach, and, and frankly, if you're going to do that, this is the way you need to play the game. Otherwise, we just roll them out and say, hey guys, off you go, go play 11 players, go play, go figure it out. But that's not the way we work. We want the guys to be prepared for every game, to enjoy it, but also have a style that they can be proud of, uh, and one that we enjoy kind of, kind of getting better at every day. So, league attention from John Arlia, league attention earlier this week from Kelsey Steele and Scott Stewart, the uh, Steel Some Time podcast from the USL. If not, national attention from writers like Jeff Reuter of TheAthletic.com, who continues to be impressed with Mark Lowry's coaching, Jerome Kiesewetter's signing, if not Locomotive FC altogether. It all sets up a big match. This Saturday night at Southwest University Park, 7.30 p.m. kickoff. Will the fireworks after the game be anything like the fireworks you see on the field? We'll find out. Locomotive FC putting its nine-game unbeaten streak on the line against a Lights FC team that blasted New Mexico United 5-1 at Cashman Field last weekend. Now, New Mexico United continues to be just a little bit distracted by this Lamar Hunt U.S. Open Cup thing because they're still in it. First of all, congratulations to United and St. Louis FC. The two USL championship teams that went into the fifth round of the Open Cup are still in the competition headed to the quarterfinals. Best of fortunes to them. But did that 5-1 win mean that Eric Winalda's squad has finally turned a corner? Who's to say? Eric Winalda has certainly been around member of uh, three World Cup teams, including that iconic 1994 squad. The first American to play in the Bundesliga. Scored the first goal ever in Major League Soccer history. Fox Sports commentator 
a pundit known for speaking his mind. Just last year, he was a candidate for president of U.S. soccer, where he suggested, among other things, that the United States have promotion relegation. No, that didn't make any waves at all. A successful manager of some teams in the lower divisions of American soccer as well, before his current job as head coach of Lights FC. At every step along the way, Waldo has had something to say. Here, that includes a frank discussion about watching his home burn to the ground in California's Woolsey Fire late last year, when Alden and his family were told to leave in the middle of the night, and within minutes his house was gone. Among the prized possessions lost, the jersey from the national team's opening game of World Cup 94, where Wijnaldum scored that amazing free kick against Switzerland in the Pontiac Silverdome. Among those saved, this photograph of his wife Amanda and their infant son Braden. Between losing a contentious vote to lead U.S. soccer and his home and starting his own version of a Vegas residency and turning 50 earlier this month, Eric's gained a lot of perspective just within the last year. But don't get me wrong, Eric Winalda is still one of the biggest personalities American soccer has. From 1990s U.S. men's teams compared to today's men's team, he makes that comparison. It's tactics, today's team's posing, his own team, even himself. Waldo always has a take, and he's not afraid to use it. And welcome everyone, Duke Keith here with legendary former U.S. men's national team forward and head coach of the Las Vegas Lights, Eric Winalda. Coach, we appreciate you taking time out today, uh, especially today, which is, is pretty cool. This is the 25th anniversary of, uh, what was it, about a 25-yard free kick against Switzerland, tied the game in World Cup 1994. It was a magnificent effort there uh, in the 45th minute to, to tie that game. And um, I, I, I know you've been tweeting about it, tweeting about World Cup 94 in general. Um, how does it how does it affect you uh, 25 years down the line? What were your memories of those uh, of that particular day? Well, after 25 years, it's hard to remember anything, but it's, uh, it is a long, uh, a long time ago, but it, it does uh, always bring our group back together. Uh, that 94 team was, was a special time in this country. It was, you know, we didn't even have a professional league yet, but um, uh, we are coming up on our anniversary. There's been emails going back and forth. Uh, with, with the guys that, you know, just talking about it and, and remembering the, 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 the cool moments. I mean, that, that goal itself is, is a story within itself, but it, it, was, uh, it was a really important moment in, in U.S. soccer history. I'm, I'm proud and honored to, uh, to be a part of it. It's uh, one of the few times in my career that the ball went exactly where it was supposed to go. <laughs> I, I, I will admit that they don't always go exactly where they're supposed to but it uh, turned out to be uh, a fabulous moment I, and I did tweet about the just the, just how loud that stadium got I, I you know I've played all around the world in, in many stadiums but I, in my recollection I I, I I was describing it to somebody just the other day and and the reason why I, I literally stopped in my tracks while I was trying to figure out how I was going to celebrate was because it was so loud and you could almost feel the ground move. So it was, uh, wow. it was pretty intense. I, you know, and, and all of us on that team, um, you know, then, then our next game was against Columbia, uh, which was um, a, a wonderful victory for us. And Ernie Stewart scored a terrific goal. And yeah, uh, Marcelo almost scored. Lexi Lalas <laughs> did score and they called it back on offside. And if we had uh, VAR today, that we would have won the game three to one. So, we we um we look back at those you know 25 years and we we cherish that that opportunity to represent our country in a world cup it it was a special moment in time well and uh, and we'll get to some of the folks who have uh, certainly made great careers in american soccer if not around the world here in a little bit but uh i i remember one of the coolest things about that particular day was it was the first game played indoors right i think in Certainly in World Cup history, maybe in soccer history with a big natural turf, I don't know. But that was amazing and probably contributed uh, contributed quite a lot to the noise. Well, the, yeah, that's that's cleanly why it was so loud. I think Lexi was teasing me because we were roommates. And at the time, I wasn't allowed to discuss this. Um, oh? Because I had an adverse reaction to, uh, to a, a sports drink. Um, the day before the game, and it was uncertain whether I was going to 
to even be able to participate because I had hives all over my body. Oh, dear. From um, what, what had happened was, I won't say the name, but we were always Gatorade. And uh-huh. we switched to a different sports drink. Uh-oh. The two days before the game, and I'm allergic to red dye 40, which is uh, something that you'd see in Jello or. Um, Did you know that at the time? I, I knew what I was allergic to, and I knew that um, I was not allergic to Gatorade. So the the other drink that that they put inside Gatorade bottles, believe it or not, and oh, then taped dear. them up, but didn't tell us, was a cheaper version of Gatorade. It wasn't all natural. It was all the stuff I was allergic to. So I, oh, I consumed about two, you know, it was a big hot day the day before the game, and <laughs> we trained outdoors. It was very humid. So I put down a couple of bottles of this, and then they told me what it was, and I had to inform the, uh, the medical staff that I was anticipating uh, some sort of breakout because I, I'm allergic to that. So sure enough, about 2 o'clock in the morning, uh, I was covered in hives. Uh, it was this, it, ironically, it was the same night that uh, O.J. Simpson was um, <laughs> on his famous chase. Yeah. And I couldn't sleep. Uh, we had to, the only thing that they could give me was Benadryl. That would be w- w- within the FIFA regulation. So I went onto the field pretty swollen. If you look at the pictures closely of, of my hand on my heart during the national anthem, you can tell that my body was uh, uh, reacting to to something, but you know, the, the guys still kid me today. They said, man, you should, I don't care if you're allergic to it, whatever's in it, it, it helped you. So <laughs> you should probably drink more of that stuff. Good things happen when you do, but it was as beautiful of a, of a goal and a beautiful day it was for everybody. It was a miserable one for me. I, it took me, um, it took me at least four or five days to recover from uh, the reaction, but it, it all worked out. So we, we, we look back and laugh now. <laughs> well, it's uh, it'll probably a little easier to laugh 25 years down the line. Speaking with former U.S. men's national team great Eric Winalda, head coach of the Las Vegas Lights, coming to town this weekend to take on Locomotive FC. So many of the guys from that 94 World Cup squad, so many of the guys from U.S. men's soccer from 1990 through 94, uh, went on to really influence the game, as well you should have. Um, Ernie Stewart, we, we talk about what, what he's been able to do, not only in his uh, native Netherlands, uh, but also with the Philadelphia Union. Uh, yourself, Fox Sports commentator, you've been uh, in with Atlanta, did a wonderful job uh, managing them. You're with Lights FC now. Uh, we talk about Alexi Lalas, um, another Fox Sports commentator, but also has a history in Major League Soccer. So many of you went on to influence the game, but really, how could you not? Uh, you were the golden generation, the first people to get the United States back to a World Cup in 40 years in 1990. Um, you talk about the influence of that squad and, uh, and and what you think the legacy is for you guys 25 years down the line. Uh, you know what the legacy, I hope, is just, you know, a, a team that of guys that, you know, we came from, as you said, from very different backgrounds. I mean, you had a kid from St. Louis and Mike Sorber playing next to a a guy that barely spoke English at the time, uh, (laughs) Thomas Dooley. Yes. Uh, And then, of course, Ernie, who came to us from uh, from the Netherlands. And you still had guys like Joe Max Moore, who was was a a great college player that that never even got on the field for in 94, but was a huge influencer. Uh, Frankie Klopas, you could say the same thing about Roy Wegerly. And Claudio Reyna, who tragically got hurt prior to the first game, and he was he was in the starting lineup. Harks and, and Tab Ramos, Calus Jury, and then just this year we lost Fernando Clavijo uh, yes. to cancer, um, and it actually brought us back together, all of us, you know, because of Fernando's death, we we all reconnected with each other, and and in remembrance of him, uh, what a great guy he was, but. Uh, that team, I think, what we if, if we have a legacy and if we have anything that we can look at our team now or, or maybe even the last decade and have a criticism of, of who we are as Americans and what we represent uh, as a national team, it would be personality. Uh, we, we were a team that wasn't just Alexi Lalas and Kobe Jones and funny haircuts. We were, we were guys that, and you could throw Tony Miola in that, Whatever the hell that was that he, he <laughs> mullet to have on his head. Yeah, uh, we were we were guys that that just had an, an inner passion for the game. Uh, we recognized the moment uh, and the magnitude of it. 
of how important it was for us to represent our country well on the world stage and the fact that it was our opportunity to introduce the sport really to a lot of Americans who um, at that time probably were were not really aware of, of, of the sport itself, uh, the passion behind it. They were introduced to, you know, sold out stadiums with the rest of the world, you know, paying visit to our country and, and showing us what, what passion looks like. So um, it was it was an honor to be a part of it. And at the helm of the whole damn thing is Bora Milutinovic, who <laughs> I think he spoke seven languages, but I, the problem with that was he spoke them all at the same time. And we, we, really, we really had a hard time understanding him at times, but um, we, were, we were the kind of team that, that bonded for various reasons. And at the end of the day, we, we did our best. It wasn't ultimately good enough, but it, we, we introduced our country uh, to the sport uh, in, in a way that I think had a long-lasting legacy. And uh, even today, we look back at it and, 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 and we smile and we remember uh, the good and the bad but, but, and, and the learning process that we went through as a country. But again, I, I always humbled and honored to be a part of that. Well, I mean, the uniforms are just fire. I mean, I think they should bring those back. The the the, the big baggies with the with the the blue the blue unis with the white stars. Those were incredible. Hey, we're bringing them back. We are actually going to really uh, on the fourth of July and our I think two home games from now. We're going to on the fourth of July uh, wear that exact uniform and and just not just to honor the, the you know the twenty five <laughs> years, but to honor our country with the stars and stripes. They talked me into it. I, I, at the time, it, it, the, the uniform took so much criticism, um, and, and we we used to blame it on Andre Agassi with his denim. Uh, it, <laughs> That's right. It was I, denim. It was a Levi's thing, wasn't it? Right. Yeah. Yes. Exactly. So it felt like this this denim thing. But um, you know, I still, I still think that uh, uh, that uniform was pretty cool, uh, and it's it's definitely definitely authentic. And we're going to bring it back. So the wow. Las Vegas Lights FC are going to play in our home game against uh, Los Angeles uh, in that uniform. So we're going to go blue, red, white, and celebrate our country and celebrate <laughs> the 25 years appropriately. So are I'm, they, I'm looking forward to that as well. Are they going to let you put on the 11? You know what? Maybe. I, okay. I just tried the uniform on, but I look a hell of a lot different than I did um, you know, 25 years ago. But I had to suck it in for the picture. But sure. We, um, you know, I, I, I think it's funny you say that because – when you've played for your country as, as many times as I have, I always look at the who's wearing 11 first. I sure. can't help it. it it's, uh, it's just uh, it's become such a part of me that, um, uh, that if you have the chance to put on the 11 again would be, would be fun. I think, I think we might, you might, you might have just given us a marketing idea there. We, we might uh, go run with that. I might just show somebody's taking notes. Man number 11 on game day. But there we we'll go. See. Absolutely. You gotta, you gotta attempt the free kick though. You've got to do that at least at once for the crowd. They're it might casual. go a little slower. Okay. Um, but hopefully it ends up in the vicinity of where it's supposed to. You know, <laughs> I, I won't have to hit it that hard, and I don't think I can anyway. But right. as long as uh, uh, as long as we distract the goalkeeper, it might go in. There we go. Um, go I'm sure in Vegas you can think of something. Hey, let me ask you about uh, uh, and let me ask you about Lights FC and and you've taken on various projects throughout you know the lower divisions of american soccer and you've succeeded in every one of them this team seems to have given you a, well it's been a particular challenge because at home at cashman field you guys have been dominant on the road it's been a completely different story have you been able to kind of figure out the keys of, of what's going on and what lights fc needs uh, when you hit the road at the beginning of that question you you, you said the, the, the perfect word project um, right. And this is a project that, uh, you know, maybe, maybe I got to chalk this one up to my own arrogance that I believed that I could fix, um, certain players that, that I believe that I have believed in some players that they could make the jump, uh, from, from the lower ranks uh, that, that right. they could, they could play in a professional game, uh, and, and perform. And that learning process for them uh, has been much harder than I anticipated. And that doesn't mean I, I'm going to give up on these guys, which I certainly haven't, but we, uh, we have had uh, some, some massive issues on the road with uh, miscommunication, 
with having to, to, to play guys out of position at times, uh, what, what, what really hamstrung us at the beginning of the season is that we started off very well in our preseason, and we lost Brian De La Fuente, who was slated to play left back for us and was our captain. And in that moment where we, we, we were forced to try and figure out the left back position, we just have been in constant mode of trying to fill that void and fill that hole. Um, we've tried out seven guys at that position, and none of them have stuck. And the main problem was is that Javon Torre uh, was playing in the middle of the park with Gabe Robinson on most of these occasions, and the communication and or breakdowns were all happening in the same spot, and they were happening on our left side. So. Um, Christian Torre, um, Torres tried to, to play in there. We've had Matt Thomas try and play in there. Uh, Sosa, we, Eric Gonzalez. It, it's been a revolving door. But um, to answer the second part of your question, Dejan Jakovic uh, has joined our group from LAFC. Uh, he's 33 years old. He's a guy that I have tracked for the entirety of his career. Um, He's jumped around a bit. He went to Japan. He played for D.C. He's the captain of Canada. Uh, wasn't getting games at LAFC. And, and because of the relationship that I have with Bob Bradley and uh, the conversations went in the right direction. And, and Javin is just a very clean professional who just needed to play. And um, he knew that I liked him. He knew that I, I, I would be a good guy to play for. And we, since he's joined our team, we've just had a different look. And we've had a little bit more experience back there and our ability to, to deal with crosses, our ability to deal with spacing uh, has been incrementally better since he's been here. And it's only game two, but uh, I think going on, this will be his first road game and this will be the first road game that we have him in our lineup. And uh, I, I just think that, that he makes things very difficult for the opposition because of the way he reads the game. So hopefully not to say that we've figured it out or we've solved the problem, but hopefully we'll we'll give a much better uh, disciplined uh, effort on the defensive side of the ball uh, in El Paso. Well, 5-1, I think, uh, uh, was at home at Cashman Field, 5-1 over uh, the previous Western Conference leaders for much of the season in Mexico United. Uh, probably speak something to that. And when you talk about that kind of experience, I'm sure it's one thing you having played in Germany – you having played around the world, you having played in, in Major League Soccer, it's one thing for the coach to tell some of these younger guys this. It's another to have that dude in the locker room, isn't it? Yeah, I, I, I couldn't agree with more with that. I mean, one of the things that, that you, you, you need, um, and, and it's almost a formula, if you will, is, is another voice on the field uh, who's very instrumental in, in organizing and keeping guys disciplined and keeping them in their spots and understanding their roles. I had that with Brian De La Fuente. Um, and I, I think that, that not to say that, that, that you know, we, we, went, we became a very good team and, and then became a very bad team the second that we lost Brian, but we certainly were uh, more insecure um, um, on, the, on the defensive side of things. And it, it's, it, it has been a struggle. It has been a project. We had a horrible game at RGV. Um, and you know you go look you go back and look at the stats and they had uh, three shots on goal and somehow managed to score five times. You you <laughs> you you look at that and you say okay that's funny but it it's it's really an indicator that um, uh, we we had some guys back there who didn't have the experience and maybe the nerves got them the, the the better of them and we suffered for it. We lost four four zero to Phoenix and then on the heels of that we lose four zero to to Reno and. As bad as that sounds, those games really weren't 4-0 games. They sure. they were just they were just games that that um, we ended up having to chase, and subsequently lost badly. But you know the the reality was that they probably should have been more along the lines of a 2-1 or a 2-0 scoreline, but it, not 4-0. That can wear on your confidence, and that can really beat you up. So um, the challenge has really been getting organized and having these guys start to believe in their abilities, but also. You know, look, it's it, it, it's not it's not all about them. It, you know, I'll take uh, uh, some of the blame for that as as the manager of, of of not being able to get that message across. So, 
you know, it's, it's the old stupid saying, you know, if, if something good happens, you did it. If something bad happens, I did it. And yeah. if something fantastic happens, we did it. So we have to have a fast, uh, we, we finally had a fantastic moment where we did it. We, we beat New Mexico uh, handily and we did it uh, with a performance that I think we can all be proud of. The question now is, can we build off of that? So we have to do it in El Paso. We have to do it on the road. And uh, we're catching a team that's clearly in great form. Speaking with uh, Las Vegas Lights head coach Eric Winalda, former U.S. men's national teamer, and uh, kind of shifting back to something a little more personal. Um, I've, I've followed you on Twitter for a while, and I know that your, your run for the presidency of U.S. soccer took a lot out of you, and then came the fire. And your family has had to pick up and move. Uh, I know that, that, you know, how how good was it to have the opportunity to do something in the game in Las Vegas? You know, wh- how was the timing of this for you and for your family? I'd say it's a great question. I mean, the, the presidency itself was was just a passion play. It, it was an opportunity where I felt that that maybe there was a window there where this country was ready for real change. And maybe I could be the guy to invoke that kind of change. It didn't work out. Um, a lot of people thought that, that took a big, was a big hit to my ego. That really, really wasn't it. I, I am in full support now of Carlos Cordero, and I told him that privately, uh, and I'm, I'll do it publicly. That that it, when you lose an election, just because you you didn't win it, and you don't get to to you know to put all your ideas or, or change in place, that doesn't mean that you stop supporting. Uh, the efforts to, to become a better soccer nation. So there's that part of it. But when the fire happened, uh, I was already, I already took the job pretty much. And I was already um, working for LA uh, for uh, moving, making them transition from LA to, to Las Vegas. And when, when you really think about it uh, as a family and as a guy that was making a transition out of the, the, the broadcast booth and wanting to, to have an opportunity to coach, it took a commitment from my entire family. And I got a big crew. I got six kids. Right. And sitting down with my wife and sitting down with the kids and, and really talking about it. And the, the coolest thing that happened was my, my daughter said to me, you need to take your own advice, Dad. And I said, what's that? And she said, do what you love and love what you do. You finally get a chance to do what you love Go do it and go, you know, maybe you didn't win the presidency. So what? But uh, she came up with the phrase that I put on my Twitter, my Twitter, uh, my, my Twitter page says, uh, stop trying to change the world and change the room you're in. And uh, that's Wonderful. coming from a 14 year old. So <laughs> uh, as a parent, I'm pretty, I'm proud of that. <laughs> I'm proud of my, uh, uh, the job we're doing raising these kids, but I did take her advice and uh, although this is a very difficult project and it's not easy in coaching and management of young, impressionable kids who are living in a town that has more vices than anywhere else in the, in the, in the country and, and trying to get them to understand what it means to be a pro and to fulfill their own dreams. You know, I, I have six kids. I feel like I got 24 more when I walked into this locker room. Sure. And it's, now, it's now a scenario where um, it is what I'm supposed to be doing. I do love it. Uh, I, that has never changed. Uh, I, I accept the challenge of it all, but um, the fire, all of that, it, it, and the move here, it, it just brought my family closer together. And we appreciate we appreciate each other. Uh, we look at life as a blessing, um, and we have we believe also that as a family that there is a a higher power that sometimes chimes into the equation and. <laughs> Everything does happen for a reason, so we're, we're thrilled to be here. Uh, we are going to put the family back together because school is out, and they'll be joining, uh, joining me shortly um, uh, in, in Vegas and everything. The, the world will be complete again. But, you know, look, I've been, I've been here for you know, a little over eight months now, and it's, I've been out here uh, commuting. Basically, well, not commuting. I've lived here, but my family hasn't been with me. Sure. So that is a huge um, um, part of this because as, as much as I wanted to dedicate to the work, you know, this past weekend was Father's Day uh, and coming on the heels of my birthday and my family was with me for the whole 
duration. Wow. Some people believe, well, that's a distraction. You know, you got to be a dad and you got to, you know, you got little ones and all that stuff. I would attribute that 5-1 win to the peace of mind that I had of just knowing that my family was with me and they were here and they're in support of what we're doing. So that's just, that's just me. I, I'm looking forward to uh, having the whole family back together under the same roof and all those really late nights with young ones and early mornings and breakfasts and lunch, dinner. And uh, we do this thing called highs and lows at dinner every night when we're together. And our kids basically tell us what was their high of their day, what was their low. And we did it the other night and they all had the same highs that we were together. So wonderful. Um, all of that stuff is, is, is important to me. Speaking with Eric Winaldo, former U.S. men's national teamer, former Fox Sports commentator, former candidate for president of U.S. soccer, and currently the head coach of Las Vegas Lights. As we kind of steer toward the finish here, Eric, I did want to ask you about, about U.S. soccer today. Uh, a big win in the Gold Cup to start things off, but the, the, obviously everybody has questions. Greg Berhalter, uh, who is currently the head coach, wants to play, you know, wants to play with the ball. Um, that style takes a little time. Everybody wants results right now. What are your thoughts? I mean, I've heard a lot of people talk about heart. The, the, the way you guys, the 94 guys, you know, went into this was not with the most talent, but certainly nobody was going to beat you in terms of your spirit. Do you think that has changed with the U.S. men's national team? And what would you like to see uh, to add to their, well, to create some measure of success for that squad? Well, I, I think it's a more of an indicator of just a societal thing. You know, I mean, we our kids today are are entitled. They they think that they've already proven something or they deserve something that that, um, that sometimes isn't there. So, you know, back in our day, we we were fighting every day for respect to earn the respect of of not just the, the people next to us, but the people watching us. And not to say that we represent the country better, or, or I don't want to go down that route, but sure. I do think. <clears throat> that the fight that we had was collective and it was deliberate and it was something that was understood within our group. Um, the other tactical part of this, if I'm you know, connecting dots here, is that you know, wanting to play with the ball is something that I've learned in this league is not going to be a determining factor whether you win or lose. Uh, it actually tires you out. Um, I love to have the ball. I love I loved to, and on the first, I would say the first 14 games of the season, I was all about possession. Um, this is a difficult league, and they're being being smart and being efficient is what I would say our team used to be. Um, being demanding of our players and and expecting them to be 100 miles an hour all the time is a mistake. It's it's not that we're not talented enough to do it. It's just we're all humans. And you, there has to be some efficiency there, and there has to be some understanding of of, of rhythm, and and I'll let the other team have the ball every once in a while. And you know, I heard an analogy from one of our—I won't throw his name under the bus—but one of our our, our national team guys. Uh, the only thing I will say is it was not Tab Ramos because I want to make sure <laughs> Tab knows that okay. I'm not talking about him. But there was somebody in that camp that said. We need all of the light bulbs lit up at the same time. Okay. So all of our 11 players need to be going 100% all the time, and if they can't do it, then and the light bulb starts to flicker, we need to just replace the light bulb. And I thought to myself that that's not soccer, and that's unrealistic. You know, the beauty of this game is that, and, and especially in a good team, and I, I would say that in the 1994-95 men's national team was one of the best teams I've ever been a part of. And it was because of the recognition of the ebb and flow of a game. And sometimes not everybody's going to have the best game, but you got to you got to pull your weight, and then sometimes you got to you got to pick pick somebody else up and do a little bit extra. You can't just put it into blocks and say, okay, that's your job. Don't screw up. This is my job, and then anything that doesn't happen in my space is not my problem. Uh, but if it happens in your space, I can't wait to point the finger and make sure everybody knows that you screwed up and not me. That's not a good team. That's not. And that analogy with those light bulbs is the way I've always looked at it is they're flickering all the time. Sure. 
It's, it's the moment it's that they sport. all light up, maybe for a second at the same time, and something beautiful happens. That's the game. That's, what the, that's the game that we all love, and that's why we all sit there for 90 minutes waiting for all the light bulbs to go at the same time. Right. And that's, that's, that's part of my criticism of U.S. soccer is that I, I think that we're getting carried away with the tactics. We're getting carried away with the PowerPoint presentations, and we need to start mm-hmm. identifying who are the guys – that are going to represent our country the best, who have the character to do this and can get through adversity. Because trying to pretend like the adversity is not going to happen is not smart. And to say that, that, you know, we go through a bad stretch, it's how you react to the bad stretch. It's, it's what happens after that, that that determines whether you can play this game at a high level, not whether you can just put your hand up and say, it didn't work out, take me out, wasn't my day. Uh, I see a lot of that in some of our players now. And, of course, they're getting criticized a little bit more than we did, and there's, there's social media, and I saw somebody take a shot at Jossie Zardis, who had Sandra Bullock's character from Bird Box oh with, the, with, the, with the, the, blindfold. Uh, the blindfold on, yeah. and then in the caption said, Jossie Zardis in, in the, in the six-yard box. And, you know, that stuff, you know, to somebody that's funny, but I think when we get hypercritical – what we start doing, uh, which might also be another societal observation, is that we're, we're fighting against each other uh, about everything. And not until we come together and we have a common goal as a country, as a team, not just the 11 guys on the bench, but everybody in that stadium and anybody that has any aspirations to be a part of that 11, we all got to be on the same page. We got to be pulling the same boat. We're, we're, we're trying and aspiring to be a better soccer nation. Stop criticizing your team. Support them. Fans comes from the word fanatic. We don't, we're not fans. We're supporters. So let's figure out what that means to do that. Once again, with Las Vegas Lights head coach Eric Winalda, um, I don't know. Well, you probably don't remember this, but uh, I remember interviewing you after the 1998 Open Cup win, the San Jose Clash over the El Paso Patriots 2-0. Right here in El Paso, game, yeah, you do. Big John Doyle and you came out and uh, and talked to the media. I forget if you scored in that game or not, but an assist. Okay, there you go. How about that? Well, I, I remember interviewing you then. Um, it'll be great to have you back in the Sun City, and um, all all the best of uh, of luck to you guys uh, throughout the season and to you and to your family personally. Uh, I, I want to uh, uh, wish you the best. It's great to hear your voice again. Looking forward to seeing you and. Um, seeing you in person. That would be great. Absolutely. we we'll look forward to it. Thank you very much. And uh, it has been an absolute pleasure watching you these many years as a player, as a coach on Fox Sports, uh, doing your thing for television and, uh, and look forward to seeing what uh, Las Vegas Lights has to offer in the future. Eric Winalda with us and with you. Thank you very much, Coach. My pleasure. 7.30 p.m. kickoff at Southwest University Park. This Saturday, Locomotive FC putting its nine-game win streak on the line versus Eric Quinalda and Lights FC. We certainly hope you join us uh, at Southwest University Park. You can watch the game later on ESPN+. Plus. They replay anytime you want. Those things are, like, archived. But you can watch it live on the El Paso Las Cruces CW if you absolutely cannot make it out. Better to go experience the fireworks firsthand on the field and after the game. Michael Balligan and I will have the call. We certainly hope to see you there. Until then, let's head to the roundhouse. They can't corner us there.